you very much <coughs> to Urban Age for having invited me <coughs> to this conference. Um, I've been asked to <coughs> talk about urban interventions in Lima. Uh, I've actually <coughs> reduced the length of my, <coughs> or the extension of my uh, intervention because I think that various of the issues I thought <coughs> of talking about have already been raised. And on the other hand, there are other things which I've heard which I think I would like to uh, incorporate into my presentation. To begin with, Lima, Lima is a city whose problems are very much like those of Sao Paulo, Bogotá, Medellín, Caracas, that is to say, of most Latin American metropolitan cities. So I'm going to just whisk through them uh, to, <coughs> it'll, to sort of uh, verify for you to see how much alike they are. And from there, I would like to go on very quickly to <coughs> make a few reflections on what I think this means. Uh, <coughs> as you can see in that diagram, Lima, on the right-hand side, as all most other Latin American cities, has also increased in population dramatically over the last half century. The next one, please. What can we do? Yeah. As you can see in those graphics, from roughly 800,000 in 1960, it has grown to nearly 9 million in, uh, in, pre in the present day. 80% uh, of the population of, of uh, Lima proceeds, comes is from immigration from the highlands, from the inner parts of Peru. And 77% uh, of the population, of that population, would emigrate, would leave the country if they could. Uh, in 1948, the photograph on the left shows 25% of the urbanized area of Lima. The photograph on the right shows 2% of the urbanized area of Lima. Of course, the photograph <coughs> represents the same area. You can see that the right-hand side photograph, which shows as the left-hand side one, the historic part has shrunk to be only 2% of the total area. This <coughs> very, uh, uh, very uh, persistent growth has, of course, generated the same problems we all know. And it has always been tried to, the, the problems have always been tried to be curtailed through legislation. This sort of document you see here are one of the many laws who have been passed as if through legislation you could actually put a stop to that. And in this graphic you can see the laws on the lower part side and the way <coughs> the population has literally laughed at them by <coughs> ignoring them and having new laws passed to try and overcome this. Uh, a long time ago, 40 years ago, the British architect, John Turner, uh, <coughs> who happened to be in Peru in the 1950s, uh, realized that uh, architecture and planners had to do something about this, that the, the flocking of uh, rural population into Lima was rising dramatically, and he made very valuable recommendations to change this. Another English architect called Peter Land, who happened to live there in the 1960s, there were no actually professional contact between them, uh, <coughs> then on, on, the, on account of uh, Turner's reflections decided to do a, a, an international competition through the United, Na through the United Nations to try and bring uh, international architectural expertise into the confrontation of this, this situation. Uh, however, <coughs> uh, none of the recommendations uh, done by uh, produced by Turner were actually followed. Uh, what actually has, has occurred since then is that the Peruvian ruling class, Peruvian mainly professional class or political class, has tended to ignore these conditions and tended to cope with them <coughs> by just letting them go and trying to adapt, trying to run the political wave as uh, swiftly as they could. Uh, this has caused the uh, process of <coughs> uh, growth to become gradually more severe. Uh, the city has grown to the size you see there, no, there now. The total metropolitan, let's say, uh, political area of Lima is nearly 3,000 square kilometers. And uh, that has generated its sheer size is a gener and the, f the fact that very little has been done to cope with the problems arising but such a steep growth has generated a dramatic problems in terms of service and in terms of transportation. To begin with, 
Lima does not have a public transport system. Uh, all public transportation is private, which accounts for what this <coughs> uh, figure tries to show, a, a, a disastrous really Inef disastrously inefficient system of transport. I'm sorry. This inefficiency <coughs> uh, can be can be uh, understood uh, through uh, the way uh, uh, different num different kinds of moving facilities are concentrated. Uh, the extension of Lima has likewise fallen all its rural area. So, as you can see in these diagrams, this meaning to say that. The Peruvian inhabitant only Lima only enjoys 1.98 square meters of uh, outdoor space uh, for its uh, life. Water is in great shortage, as you can see here. Peruvians pay five dollars for a cubic meter of water, as against the other figures you can see at the bottom. Uh, <coughs> it is, its density is extremely low, as a consequence of having spread itself out to its surroundings without any serious control. The municipality of Lima has tried to produce public works on a very shallow uh, dimension as well, because they are, not only because they lack funds, but because they are very, usually, mayors are very linked to their political interests. So they try to embark on works which they will be able to finish within their government. So it's mainly roads, interchanges, and in the case of Mayor Castañeda, who is now in, in charge, he has had this uh, <coughs> personal idea of building these staircases in the shanty towns, which uh, make people's climbing the hills easier. The, the fact, of the, the problem of climbing the hills, and that has made him a very popular politi political figure. He now enjoys nearly 80 percent approval amongst Peruvians. On the other hand, the fact that the central part of Lima is clogged has <coughs> led private investment to developed other uh, centers around the periphery of Lima, which are mainly shopping centers, shopping centers which are described in <coughs> and, in, and highlighted in the graphic on the left-hand side, and which are the usual kind of mall that you can see in any part of the world. These <coughs> buildings, uh, of course, do not represent any form of architectural, uh, architecturally remarkable buildings. However, having uh, shown you this, I don't think any of these buildings are architecturally or urbanistically very relevant due to the overwhelmingly larger presence of self-built housing and commercial buildings in the shanty towns, which we call barriadas, and the less extended but likewise a dominating reality of sprawling middle-class promoter or private neighborhoods on the other hand. <coughs> uh, this conference has made very clear to me that beyond the evidence that we may be able to make more or less intelligently or statistically clear, there is a fundamental problem underlying the urban reality we are dealing with, with that which underlines all the presentations that have been made with regards to other Latin American cities, and that is the issue of poverty. The word poverty, I think, hasn't been mentioned in the, com in the conference so far. And I think this is true because poverty is an essential aspect of our Latin American metropolis. I think we cannot deal with the issue of contemporary urban growth without making clear distinctions between citizens which have, to the, who, which have to confront poverty as a central problem and those who don't. I don't want to sound moralistic, but running through <coughs> everything that has been said these two days, I have the impression that we risk being submerged in our own professional, technological, or academic media, thus overlooking that beneath our specific concerns looms the question of poverty, which, let's face it, constitutes an unbearable situation for those who suffer it. We are concerned with the issues of poverty in urban sprawl, mainly because we cannot avoid <coughs> recognizing it in its forthcoming somatic dimension. The poor cannot conceal the awful condition in which they live and work. <coughs> we cannot ignore that expression, but we can overlook its other dimensions, hunger, insecurity, marginalization, fear. Amongst these shortages lies defenselessness. Abuse, defenseless in the face of abuse, choice, <coughs> uh, recognition. I think that in order to be able to provide the poor with better tools to confront defenselessness, not only physical but also psychological, educational, or moral, we have to gear our capacities so that which we may provide 
towards <coughs> relieving that burden should be made available in massively efficient ways. I believe that a good antidote to defenselessness that can provide a good background for architecture is leadership. In order to verify this assertion, <coughs> we have to only to turn to the success of leadership of the past mayors of Bogotá, hopefully here, thankfully here, Medellín, Curitiba, and others, by impressing on their task a clear and intelligent sense of purpose and compromise, some of the worst scorches, scourges of shanty towns have started to be overcome. Leadership implies governance, and governance implies political compromise. They both need a form of charisma that can embrace and direct the sense of direction we all need to make of our consensus work. 